Today I'm going to talk about five ways nutrition can impact ADHD symptoms. To me, helping a child with ADHD is like solving a jigsaw puzzle. You have to identify the different pieces of the puzzle and fit them in and to complete it. So today I'm going to talk about five nutritional jigsaw puzzle pieces. There are other nutritional pieces, and then there are pieces like sleep and um, uh, exercise and things like that that I won't go into today. But we're going to talk about fixing poor diets, artificial food colors and flavors, food sensitivities, essential fatty acid deficiencies, and vitamin D deficiency. So here's a, uh, the first point that I want to make. This is the importance of eating an A-plus diet. And we see the typical American diet on the left and a much more healthy diet on the right. I like to think of our bodies as being the most amazing chemical factories ever designed. On the at the entrance to the factory, there are vitamins and minerals, amino acids, essential fatty acids, about 50 different nutrients that must be taken into the factory. Then they're assigned to different assembly lines. And out the back come over 100,000 different chemicals. And these are used for energy, to make muscles, for brain chemicals, for everything. So if you don't have the raw materials going in to the factory in the right amounts, you won't have the right chemicals coming out. Years ago, the government came up with the Food Guide Pyramid. They were hoping to help people lose weight. Uh, that didn't happen, but I want to show one thing from that. Uh, they, uh, they interviewed parents who had preschoolers, and only 1% of the children met, any of, met all the recommendations of the pyramid. 16% didn't meet any. And for preschoolers, only 18% consumed the necessary vegetables. 34 fruit, 22% grain, 14% meat, 35 dairy. Well, the government ditched that plan because people gained weight instead of losing. And they came up with something called MyPlate. And it has its pros and cons, but there's some good things about it. The idea is that your plate at every meal should have about a quarter of a plate with fruits, a quarter with vegetables, a quarter with grains and a quarter with protein. And then for those who are not milk sensitive, a glass of dairy or yogurt. So the first thing I'm going to talk about are grains. So you want to choose a variety of whole grains. This is 100% whole grain bread and crackers, uh, cereals that are 100% whole grain with low sugar, brown rice, whole grain pasta, and popcorn, but not the junky kind you get at the movie theater with all the stuff added to it. The second item is vegetables. The more, the better. They provide vitamins, iron, calcium, trace minerals, complex carbohydrates, fiber, and phytochemicals. And phytochemicals are really important. They are the pigments that give fruits and vegetables their colors and also their smell and their taste. And they have really important roles in the body in uh, handling oxidative stress. Now, vegetables don't just have to be served at mealtime. They can be used for snacks, like a plate of carrots and broccoli florets with a tasty dip. A vegetable soup, a serving of vegetable soup counts as a serving of vegetables. And you don't want to overcook your vegetables because then they, kind of, they get mushy and don't have a good taste. And you want to be sure to set a good example. If you enjoy your vegetables, then maybe the kids will enjoy theirs. Okay, the next one is fruits. Uh, child needs three to four servings a day. They provide like the vegetables, all kinds of things, including the phytochemicals, a real rainbow of colors. And you want to choose a rainbow of colors of fruits and vegetables because the different pigments and the different colors of them do different things. And so a rainbow will assure that you get uh, your child gets all those that he needs. Uh, 100% pure fruit juice is not a great thing. Um, 
a lot of kids with ADHD don't do well with a glass of grape juice or apple juice. They might tolerate a small glass of orange juice or tomato juice with, uh, with food, but um, what's better is to serve a whole section orange and a whole tomato. So these are fruits, child size portions, small apple, banana, or orange, small melon wedge, half a cup pure fruit juice, but not apple and grape for sure. A third of a cup cooked or canned fruit, that's canned fruit in its own juice. Well, unsweetened applesauce, a half a cup. Okay, a child needs four, si four servings of dairy. Dairy provides protein and vitamins and minerals especially calcium and vitamin D. Many ADHD children are turned on by dairy products. So this, is a pro this can be a problem uh, with getting their milk. And we're going to talk about milk as uh, a sensitizing food in a few minutes. If your child has to be dairy free, he, will, he or she will need calcium and vitamin D supplements every day. This is very important to build strong bodies and teeth. So the serving sizes are for children, for small children, a half a cup of milk or yogurt, a one inch of cube, or a slice of natural cheese. And I'd avoid processed cheese like Velveeta and American cheese. Buy the real thing. The fifth item is protein, three to five child size portions. You want to choose low fat meats, less red meat. Uh, poultry and fish are fine if they're broiled, stewed, or baked. But you don't want to fry with them, no deep fat frying, because this destroys all kinds of essential uh, fatty acids that we're also going to talk about. For the fish, you want to stress oily, cold water fish. Then there are dry beans that will provide protein and fiber and all kinds of nutrients. There are certain ones that will provide some omega-3 fatty acids, kidney, navy, pinto, soy, and red beans. Eggs are another good source of protein. And nut butters. But if you buy peanut butter, you want to buy it with just peanuts and salt ground together. Now what about fats and oils? You want to reduce some fats. You want to reduce saturated, hydrogenated, or partially hydrogenated, trans fatty acids. And omega-6 fatty acids, these are essential, but you want fewer of them. You want to increase other fats. You want to increase omega-3 fatty acids. And these are found in canola, walnut, and flaxseed oil. Olive oil is healthy to use. And you can saute a little chicken or fish in olive oil. Um, olive oil is not, does not have any essential fatty acids, but it's still healthy. And you want to reduce sugar and sweeteners. You need to become a label reader. On the package, you'll see a nutrition facts panel and look for carbohydrates and under carbohydrate sugar, where four grams is equal to one teaspoon. It's probably easier to think of the sugar in teaspoons than grams. And you want to look at the ingredient list. And sugar comes under many different names. One thing you want to avoid is high fructose corn syrup. It's metabolized and used differently by the body and brain. And uh, it's thought to be probably harmful. Now, the American Heart Association has come out with recommendations for children because they're now publicizing that sugars are involved in heart disease. So they're recommending for children less than six teaspoons, or 24 grams per day. And how much for a child with ADHD? Well, it depends on the child. Some kids with ADHD don't seem to tolerate sweeteners at all, while others will tolerate a few teaspoons. So you'll just have to see what works for your child. So this is a nutrition facts label. And you'll see that under total carbohydrate, you have dietary fiber and then sugars. So it's the sugars that you want to look for. Um, and this product had six grams of one and a half teaspoons. And it gives you information about what vitamins are present and uh, what fats are present. What about sugar substitutes? I would avoid aspartame, saccharin, 
sucralose. Stevia is probably okay. Monk fruit is okay. And xylitol may be okay, uh, although it seems to cause diarrhea for some people. However, xylitol does seem to have some benefits. Uh, and it benefits the good bacteria in your intestine. It's thought to prevent tooth decay in children. It's thought to perhaps prevent uh, ear infections in children. So xylitol is what I use, and I think it pre tastes pretty good. So the foods you want to avoid are soda pop, fruit drinks, energy drinks, sports drinks, all candy, all high sugary foods. I know this is tough. You want to avoid white flour. At least use it just half the time and whole wheat flour the other half. You want to avoid white potato chips and fries. Recently, I came across a really interesting article in, published in Pediatrics, which is a top flight journal. It was just this year. And they studied 120 children, 60 healthy children, and 60 children with ADHD. They took down their dietary intake, and from that, they determined how much the child adhered to the Mediterranean diet. These were Spanish children, and I'll talk about the diet in a minute. What they found and reported was that children with ADHD had a lower adherence to the um, Mediterranean diet, more skip breakfast. They had a lower consumption of fruits, vegetables, pasta, and rice. They had a higher fr frequency of skipping breakfast, which is not a good idea. And they ate more fast food. They had a higher intake of sugar, candy, cola beverages, and other soda and a lower consumption of fatty fish. So this pyramid just shows the Mediterranean, and you can look at it later. But a Mediterranean diet has more fish. It's low in red meats. It's moderate in eggs, moderate in dairy products, low in sugar and sweets, high in fruits and vegetables, and the olive oil is the oil that's used. OK, let's talk about the second. Uh, dietary piece of the puzzle, artificial food colors and flavors. I just love this kitty cat. Uh, the most co in the United States, there are seven dyes that are used most commonly in foods. And the first one is red number 40. And all of these have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. And the F, D, and C number that comes before the red 40 stands for foods, drugs, and cosmetics. So if a, a dye has been approved for foods, it's also automatically approved for um, drugs and cosmetics. So red 40 is the most common one found, yellow 5, yellow 6, then blue 1. These dyes are also found, but less commonly. Blue number 2, red th uh, green number 3, and red number 3. This shows the trends in the production of food dyes in the United States. These statistics were kept by the Food and Drug Administration, and I uh, graphed them for that. In uh, 1950, the amount of food dye per person uh, per day was 12 milligrams. As you'll see, in 2010, it's up to 62 milligrams per person per day. This is almost a five times increase in their production. Where are these colors found? We well, need to read all food, beverage, drugs, and cosmetics label. And here's a hint. If a food or beverage looks too pretty, it's probably dyed with artificial colors. So here are some examples. Kind of goes on and on. And we see here that it, it all, it, the, there are dyes in the mouthwash, in the vitamins, in toothpaste, and in children's Tylenol. When we had a study at Purdue about the dyes, I was amazed to find that there was a, just a little bit of dye in fluffy white frosting in some brands of marshmallows, I guess to make those things look whiter somehow. I don't know. There's red dye in Catalina dressing. And I couldn't find in the pickle aisle any pickles that were not dyed with blue and yellow dye. 
So why are they used? Well, they're used to replace colors lost during processing, to standardize color in products. So if you buy a product in New York and in California, it will look the same. May be added to match artificial flavor uh, and to attract consumers, especially children. So here's a product, uh, strawberry milk. It's obviously um, produced for children with the Bugs Bunny on the front. And so mothers think, oh, strawberry milk, that must be nutritious. Here's the ingredient list. Yes, it's got low-fat milk in it, but we see red 3 at the end. We see natural and artificial flavors. And oops, something's missing. The strawberries. There are no strawberries in this strawberry milk. So I encourage you to uh, put a few stra uh, frozen strawberries in the blender and let and perhaps a little sweetener, and you're all fixed. So children love the bright colors. Oh, I love this mouse. This was a lab mouse that was given. Uh, the dye uh, blue number one. And you can see that its ears and its nose and its paws are all blue. And this was a study that was done in 1994. There were 200 children. For six weeks, they followed a diet free of artificial colors. 150 children had improved behavior. They were worse when colors were added back. And some of the symptoms were irritability, restlessness, and sleep problems. Of these children, they took 34 into a double-blind study where the children were either given the real dyes or a placebo. And 24 children clearly reacted. They also reported that the larger the dose, the more prolonged the reaction. So the take-home message is become a careful label reader on all products and avoid all artificial colors and flavors. And I'll tell, tell you how to test them if you're interested. Um, OK, let's talk about the third piece of the puzzle, food sensitivities. What foods turn your child on? Well, there have been studies since the mid-1980s using few foods diets. These are really restrictive diets. It was all done under the supervision of dietitians and doctors. But like with um, lamb and turkey, they would choose hypoallergenic foods. So two meats and two fruits and two vegetables and so on. And then they would, after a while, reintroduce suspected foods. And then they carried out double-blind studies of suspected foods by disguising them in safe foods. And these studies were published in major medical journals at top flight, Lancet Pediatrics, Annals of Allergy, Journal of Pediatrics. And here's one study that came out of London that was really interesting. They put 79 children on a few foods diet. 60, th these were hyperactive children. 62 improved, almost 80%. The foods that caused symptoms, 79% were sensitive to artificial colors and flavors, 72% to soy, 64 to milk, 58 to chocolate, and 49% to wheat. So different children, different foods. So how do you track down hidden food sensitivities? Well, I can't give you all the details here, but here are some of them. Um, first, start keeping a diet record of everything your child eats and drinks and how his behavior is, um, how he sleeps that night. Um, then you will want to try a careful elimination diet where you will eliminate one or two or more foods from the diet for a week. And then you try the foods back one per day. Most common problem foods are artificial colors, chocolate, and milk. And other common problems are wheat, corn, rye, egg, citrus, and legumes. 
So the take-home message is sensitivities to certain foods cause behavior changes in some children. Unfortunately, different children have different food sensitivities. They need to carry out a very careful elimination diet. Okay, the fourth nutritional piece of the puzzle are essential fatty acids. Are there good fats? Do some children need oiling? Well, essential fatty acids are essential to everyone's diet. And the reason is your own body cannot make them. They're important because they form all cell membranes and they're precursors to molecules that act as communicators between cells. So cell membranes, are, uh, fatty, fatty acids are major members of cell membranes along with some protein and things like that, protein molecules. Uh, all life takes place in the cell and the, the cell membrane keeps the inside in and the outside out. Otherwise, we would be a blob on the floor, I guess. So that the membrane also intercepts and processes signals. And the ability of cells to do this uh, depends on the composition of the cell membrane. So which fatty acids are there and what other fats and proteins. So the second thing that essential fatty acids do, they're precursors for eicosanoids. These are vital cell-to-cell -cell communicators that affect many bodily functions, including neurotransmitters in the brain and neurotransmission. OK, th there are two families of fatty acids, the omega-6s and the omega-3s. Uh, this, For those of you who've had some chemistry, this omega-6 fatty acid has uh, 18 carbons. Uh, the first double bond is uh, six carbons in from the omega end of the molecule. And there are two double bonds in this molecule. And so this is 18 to N6. And this is linoleic acid, the first member of the omega-6 family. This is an essential fatty acid, an omega-3 that is alpha linolenic acid, and it also has 18 carbons, but the first double bond is on the third carbon, and there are three double bonds present. So this is 18,3, N3, if that makes sense. This just shows the pathways um, for the omega-6s. It starts with linoleic acid, and down here is arachidonic acid, which can have an inflammatory effect. And it's not, it leads to inflammatory prostaglandins. And it's, you can see that two carbons have been added to it and two double bonds along the way. The omega-3 start with alpha linolenic acid. As we saw, it has 18 carbons, three double bonds. And it's processed until it becomes EPA and DHA with 20 and 22 carbons and five and six double bonds. These are the fatty acids you probably have heard of that are in fish oil. OK, here's something you can participate in. There are seven symptoms that are associated with, e uh, with essential fatty acid insufficiency. We uh, discovered these at Purdue. Does your child have any of these symptoms? So there are seven of them, as I said, and you want to keep score with each one. Would you rate it as zero, not at all, one, just a little, two is pretty much, and three is very much. So you want to do that for each symptom. Okay, the first symptom is excessive thirst. Does your, drink, does your child drink more fluids than other members of the family, than his peers? Does he always ask the teacher if he could go to the drinking fountain? So you want to rate it not at all, just a little, pretty much, or very much. Frequent urination. Does he go to the bathroom more often than his peers and other family members? Number three is dry skin. Does his skin feel dry to the touch? Does it flake? Um, do you have to use lotion on it? The fourth is dry, unmanageable hair. Does his hair really need a conditioner? 
The fifth one to evaluate is dandruff. Does your child have dandruff? Not at all, just a little, pretty much, or very much. Uh, number six is, does he have brittle nails? Do they break easily? Um, do they also, or do they peel easily? Either one, and this can be on nails on the fingers or nails on the toes or both. And then the last one is follicular keratosis. This uh, picture is kind of misleading, but the, the, the keratoses are really tiny, hard little bumps on the backs of the arms that are kind of white. They're tiny, and they don't itch or anything. They're just kind of there. So you want to add up those seven scores, and you should have a total. Well, this should be 0, 0 to 21, not 1 to 21. We found the higher the score, the higher the symptom score, the lower the plasma essential fatty acids were for this group of ADHD kids that we studied. So I've mentioned what food sources there are of omega-6 fatty acids. Remember, you want to decrease these. And these are food sources of omega-3. Let me mention them again: flaxseed, flaxseed oil canola oil, soybeans, navy, kidney beans, walnuts, and walnut oils, and dark green leafy vegetables. These are long-chain omega-3 fatty acids, the EPA and DHA, that are present in cold water oily fish. So they're present in fresh tuna. They, there's some of them present in the canned tuna, but the processing robs the tuna of, of most of its good fatty acids. They're found in salmon, trout, mackerel, and sardines. So the take-home message, essential fatty acids are critical for good health and normal behavior. You want to consume, consume fewer omega-6 and more omega-3s. And if you can, consume oily fish two to three times a week. And you can also use supplements, which I can't get in the, into here because it's too lengthy. The fifth one is vitamin D deficiency. And it shows these people enjoying the sunshine. Vitamin D levels seem to be related to ADHD. They studied over 1,300 children and adolescents. The vitamin D level was significantly lower in their blood in those children with ADHD compared with healthy controls. So this is the second study. 62 children. Oopsie, I skipped one. Let's see if we can. Uh, this, this is the second study. 60 ADHD patients, 30 controls. And the serum levels of vitamin D in the ADHD kids, again, were significantly lower than healthy controls. And there, was, there seems to be only one vitamin D supplementation study. Although it has been, uh, there have been studies in autistic kids. But this was one of 62 children with ADHD who were taking methylphenidate or Ritalin. So they gave one group 2,000 international units of vitamin D, and the other group got a placebo. And after eight weeks, the group receiving vitamin D had a decrease in evening symptoms, while the placebo did not. And they had also had an increased vitamin D in the blood. So why might vitamin D help? Well, there are vitamin D receptors in the brain. So the brain needs vitamin D. Genes can be affected by vitamin D. It can act as kind of an on-off switch, turning certain genes on and others off. It's involved in the making of neurotransmitters and nerve transmission. And it also helps control free radicals. So the take-home message is, ask your doctor to measure your child's vitamin D level. Then how to increase the level if the level is low? Well, you can try direct sunlight for 15 to 20 minutes without sunscreen and without a hat and without long sleeves, but not long enough to cause a sunburn, because that can lead to skin cancer, of course. So if your child is fair-skinned, you could do fewer than the 15 minutes. If he is really dark-skinned, then more than 20. 
You can also supplement with vitamin D3, uh, 1,000 to 2,000 international units per day. And then ask your doctor to repeat the blood test after a few months to make sure that your child's levels are now within the normal range. So today I hope I've given you some food for thought. ADHD is like a jigsaw puzzle. This puzzle shows the five things that we've talked about today, but there are others. You can reach me at lstevens at nlci.com or stevens5 at purdue.edu. Thank you.